The afternoon concerts this year at Newport have been organized by a member of the Newport board, Dr. Marshall Stearns. For each of the afternoon programs, Dr. Stearns has engaged an, uh, an authoritative narrator to add to the pleasure of hearing the music some guidance toward understanding and appreciating it. This afternoon, the narrator is Rudy Blesch, author of a book which very much needed writing about New Orleans jazz, Shining Trumpets, and more recently, uh, the book they all played, Ragtime, which incidentally is, uh, as an indication of its popularity, is now in a paperback edition as well. Currently, he's on the music staff of both Queens and NYU with a course in the history of jazz. Here is Rudy Blesch. I don't play, I just talk. And uh, you'll be very sorry about that before I get through. Now, I'd like to get up here first to help me, my gang. Just a minute. First is Donald Lambert, the piano phenomenon from New Jersey. Donald, sit right there. Next is the great UB Blake, composer I'm simply wild about here. Over there, Donald. I got one more coming. Willie the Lion. How about... Now we have a surprise for you, an old-time ragtime string trio coming up the stage now, um, Danny Barker's old-time, good-time, ragtime trio. Danny Barker. You see, he's an old-timer, way back in slavery days. Sit down, Danny. Come on, come on, come on, we got a concert going. Bernard Addison on mandolin, of all instruments. Last but not least, Al Hall on string bass. Um, I wish the piano players would take off their coats. We've got some work to do here. This is a rent party we're going on now. I can't take off my coat. Yes, you can. It's quite all right. Do any ladies object if, uh, if Yubi takes his coat off? Now then, you can't refuse. Well, all right then, okay. Now, how many of you know what a rent party is or was? Give me the hands. Well, a rent party was, um, can you hear me over the plane? I think we better have our concert in a hurry. You remember the Navy closed down Storyville in New Orleans and maybe they're gonna close down the jazz festival here. Could be. Now, I had just, uh, before I was rudely interrupted by the Navy, asked for a show of hands on how many of you know what is meant by rent parties or rent party piano. Uh, rent parties went along mainly during Prohibition, and uh, they had different names all over the country. I know around Chicago they were called skiffles. St. Louis called them buffet flats. In Cincinnati they were called percolators. In um, New York they were called what, Willie? House rent. House rent. House rent parties. Now, the theory of those was that nobody had any money, but some way at a rent party money was raised to pay the rent. It's one of those economic things. And don't think that they're over because this party right here is supposed to pay the rent on this baseball field right here. Don't forget, this is a rent party too. Our subject, of course, is stride piano, which I would like to say is a form of ragtime. 
Now, I would like at this point, to, if possible, to squelch a vicious rumor that I understand has been making the rounds. The rumor goes as follows, that ragtime ended with the gold rush in Alaska. This is not true. There is a rumor that the last players of ragtime died before they had a chance to get the final returns on the Spanish-American War. This is not true. It's a vicious rumor. We have some living piano players here, very much living, uh, uh, of, this, of the Eastern Ragtime School, sitting right over there. And they're far from being all that we could have had. It's a style that still goes on. And it's a style that is at the basis of all jazz, is the particular way in which ragtime piano, which began way back in the 90s, worked out a system to make music swing. Now, I don't know how many of you know how it works or how many of you know what is meant by the term stride piano. In order to demonstrate it, I'd like for, for Donald Lambert to walk over to the piano. Would you walk over, Donald? <coughs> You're still in the classroom. He isn't going to begin actually playing. This is a demonstration, but I'm going to turn him loose in about five minutes. Then all who wish to leave as the stadium burns down can go. Donald, would you play just with your left hand what we call stride, the stride bass of stride piano? Get it? Kind of an oompa. Now that doesn't swing. Now what happens with the right hand? Play with your right hand alone, will you, Donald? That's half of it. Now then, put the two halves together. Now it swings. <laughs> Donald, did you tell me something about a backhanded uh, stride bass that you had that nobody ever heard of? Could you do that backhanded? That'll swing too. Put your right hand with it, will you? Put it with the with the back end. audience another question. Does that answer the question why in the old days, uh, say around 1910, um, ragtime players were called orchestras if they just had a set of drums with them or anybody on a tambourine? In other words, you see how this thing works? Uh, there was a time, in other words, as you can hear from this, when pianists had two hands. And when the left hand was just like the rhythm section in a jazz band, it did what the drums and the string bass and the guitar do. The right hand was just like the horns, whether you would call them saxophones, trombones, clarinets, trumpets. All they had to do against that solid, set, rhythmic foundation of the left hand was get in there and swing. 
like all that a fine soloist has to do if he has a solid rhythm section behind him is get in and improvise his solo and swing against it. You know, you can't swing without something to swing against. If you don't have the swing attached to the branch of a tree, you're really nowhere. A pendulum can't swing if the top of it isn't fastened, so it swings against something. A person can't, can't swing alone. Now, ragtime in general began way back in the 90s. Uh, the theory is that it's over, and I think we've, we have, think we've already blasted that. Ragtime was, as you can hear from this one demonstration already, it was a music that was eminently happy. It wasn't worried about atom bombs. It didn't care anything except, well, it was worried about the rent. Right, yes. But not too worried. It uh, believed in letting the audience know the name of the tune that was being played. This is heresy today, but if um, they were playing T for two, you knew it was T for two. It wasn't called something else, and they sneaked it in over the chords. Now, this is all right. This is modern. I'm for modern jazz, too, but I just want to show you that there are two sides to the picture, this being the ragtime side. Now, we're going to start with, I'm going to give a separate introduction to each of the men. First, we're going to have a group of numbers from the veteran or the dean of um, Harlem Piano, the famous U.B. Blake. Now, U.B. Blake uh, corrected me. I've had him down as 78, and he came to me and he said that he's, that, that he's not an old man. He's 77. When you hear him play, you will think he's 16. So my theory is that he has, he's barely approaching the midpoint of a well-spent life, U.B.? Well, uh, of a well-spent life, the middle of a well-spent oh, life, yes. yes. The Harlem piano players, like most of the great ragtime players, uh, lots of them were famous in other ways. Besides being able to, able to play the piano, in other words, as performers, they were also famous in other ways as composers. Yubi is one of these. Yubi, uh, come over here a minute with me, will you, Yubi? Watch out the mics. Yubi had hits on Broadway as early as 1921. That's right. Uh, tell them the name of a famous one. Don't well, the ones right. that, uh, right here, uh, the songs that I have written years ago that you uh, young people would know, the famous one, or the best one, or the one that sold the most, was I'm Just Wild About Harry. I guess you know that. And then I wrote with, uh, it sounds like one of then I wrote things, but I have to say that. <laughs> Uh, then I wrote uh, Memories of You with Andy Rizzo. The first number of, uh, was I'm Just Wild About Harry. I wrote that with Noble Sissel, my present partner. That was in 21. And I'd like to tell you a little story about that, Rudy. My, my inspiration uh, was uh, a, a man by the name of Leslie Stewart. And I heard him... Uh, uh, he wrote several great tunes. And Franz Leha, he wrote The Merry Widow Waltz. And uh, when I first did uh, uh, While About Her, it didn't have any title at all. Uh, I did it in a Viennese waltz. And the girl named Lottie G, we sent for her to come from London to be the star in the show. Am I making it too long? No. And uh, we sent for this girl to come over to be the leading lady and shuffle along. When I play, you have to play a score before your stars when you have a show. And uh, I played this waltz. And she says, Mr. Blake, that's beautiful, but who ever heard of a waltz in a college show? I said, I did. So what show was it? I said, Williams and Walker, one of Williams and Walker's show. When the pale moon shines. She says, oh yes, I know that. He says, now how many copies did it sell? I said, now you got me. I don't, it didn't sell any copies. She says, change it to one step. That's what they call the fast numbers in those days. And I'll be glad to do the song. Well, she killed me dead because my God, that was my waltz. She's gonna kill my waltz. So Cecil was more commercial than I was, he says, He'll do it all right, he'll do it all right. I said, no, I won't do it. I'm going to leave it just like it is. He says, he'll do it, and we did it, and it turned out to be, well, it sold uh, the first 
three years, it sold four million copies. So and I think it's you, pretty good. You be. While you're dealing with, uh, with figures, he just gave a figure to you of four million, which is true. I want you to hear a figure which is equally true, which is the amount in dollars that it costs to put on, shuffle along on Broadway, scenery, scores, costumes, lighting, and everything. Well, <laughs> that's Shuffle Along you're talking about. Shuffle Along. So when we wrote Shuffle Along, a fellow named Harry Court, he had a concert hall. The stage was about, oh, about as deep as from here, from the end of that piano. There were two boxes on the other side. And uh, I had a number in there. I'll tell you about the price in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a number called Simply Full of Jazz. And they used to go off doing the hoochie-coochie going off, see? And they used to have to duck under these boxes. Now, we put this show on. It's, it sounds fantastic, but it's really the truth for seven hundred dollars. Now you know what it costs to put a show on now? Two fifty thousand. I'm speaking of. Now the piano. That's right. Now we're going to hear the composer. I'm simply wild about Harry. Um, uh, play Black Keys on Parade or Troublesome Ivories first. How about that? Which one? Black Keys on Parade. Black Keys. Of course, I don't have to tell you it's one of his own compositions. Black Keys on Parade. Did you remember the words yet of Lovey Joe? I'll try. Now, wait a minute. I want to tell everybody about Lovey Joe. This is another ragtime composer, one from uh, St. Louis, Missouri, who came here in the early days. Um, Jordan was his name, who wrote a song called Lovey Joe that it was used in the 1910 Follies as sung by Bell Baker. And Yubi once sang it, sang it for me, and I think we can make him do it again.
preach a man and make the preacher understand. He must join us hand in hand and join us hand in hand to love each other. That ever loving man of mine. It's at the handshaking stage at this point, but when the battle of music really begins, um, now, for a little change of pace before we bring on the lion, who will have a very special separate introduction, I'd like to uh, introduce our ragtime trio. Oh, <laughs> Danny Barker, Bernard Addison, and Al Hall, a trio especially formed for the Newport Jazz Festival. Right, Danny? That's right. What, what do you want to play first? as was requested, take me out to the ball game. Oh, that's in honor of the place where we're having the concert, right. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some popcorn and Cracker Jacks. I don't care if I never get back We'll root, root, root for the home team And if we lose, it's a shame Oh, it's one, two, three and you out jazz tunes written by Kid Ory titled Muscat Rammel. solo, titled Will's Waiting for the Sunrise. Make some noise here.
like to mention that because of budgetary considerations, this <coughs> string orchestra was a bit cut down in size. What we had in mind was the old original Clef Club in New York, a wonderful colored organization, mainly strings, that had 210 members that played all together under the leadership of the famous James Reese Europe, who took a band to Europe and introduced jazz to Europe. Now, uh, since the general idea, well, we figured we couldn't, if we could have paid for 210 players, we couldn't have gotten them on the stage. Uh, whether we could find them anymore nowadays is a question. Anyway, Ubi Blake has asked me to remind you of this fact, that instead of its being um, Paul Whiteman, who first took hot music into the concert hall, that these 210 members of the Clef Club appeared at Carnegie Hall around 1911 or 12, 210 of them on the stage playing hot ragtime and early jazz numbers. Thank you. Now we come to the third of our performers at our house rent party, Donald Lambert. I'd like to tell you a few things about him. He was born in a very good year because the year that Donald Lambert was born in 1904, he was born in Princeton, New Jersey. In Red Bank, New Jersey, a stride piano player by the name of Bill Basie was being born. And elsewhere in that same year, another very fine stride piano player by the name of Fats Waller was being born. Now, Don Lambert has been the sort of man who has kept his talents hidden under a derby hat or something. He hasn't had the publicity he should have had. He's a phenomenal player, and um, I'm going to let him prove it to you. Uh, Don Lambert, first uh, of all, is one of the men who, in the ragtime tradition, does what was known as ragging the classics. Now, that's a radically different thing than is being done nowadays. Nowadays, jazz is being classicized. This is the opposite. Not to make jazz sound like a Bach prelude or fugue, but to take a piece of serious music and subject it to a real rhythmic working over so it turns out as hot music. Uh, Don will take the uh, stage, will you? Would you do Anitra's dance as a starter? This will give you the indication of how you rag the classics.
got a real hand for that. Thereby having effectively disposed of any rumor that ragtime players didn't have any technique, that you have to go to Juilliard to have a technique, I would like for Donald to demonstrate to you another one of the great ragtime stunts, which consists of playing in counterpoint one tune with your right hand and one tune with your left. I think his favorite tune for doing that is T for two, and if I remember correctly, he plays the verse of T for two in one hand and the chorus in, in the other. Then he keeps the chorus going in the left hand while he plays almost any tune that you want to hear. I'm sure that Donald, if he was asked to, 
could play the top 20 tunes anytime with T for two in the left hand, but of course it would involve a lot of rock and roll, so let's don't suggest that. Uh, how about finishing off with a very special tune of yours, Liza? You feel like that? Right. There's going to be more of Donald later. I'm going to give you lots more Donald Lambert. <laughs> Donald's coming back, and I want to tell you incidentally also that uh, you can catch Donald if you're lucky enough to be in Orange, New Jersey, at Wallace's Cocktail Lounge, where he holds for all later forms of jazz depend in some way or other upon ragtime. After hearing Don I would make one exception. I don't think that cool jazz came from it. <laughs> now, we're ready for one of the great characters of Harlem Piano, Willie the Lion, who was born Willie Bartolf, I hope I pronounced it right, in Goshen, New York, where they have the harness racing tracks. Willie's been racing through life ever since. He got his name, come over to the piano so, I can, so you can talk back to me, Willie. He got the name of the lion in um, France, where he was um, in an artillery division. I've never figured out what he loaded the cannons with. Was it flatted fifths and diminished sevenths? Anyway, he got the name of the lion. French 75. French 75. Uh, this guy, you mean, this guy, this guy. Yeah. Anyway, Willie the lion, of course, was one of the great figures in the... In the um, house rent party era. Uh, perhaps he's one of the only living reasons that we all were a little sad to see Prohibition end. <laughs> because the parties went along with it, without the bathtub gin and the other pertinences of that, uh, of that period, the house rent parties couldn't exist. Willie, I'm going to turn you loose for three or four numbers and tell me what you want to play first. Well, Beans, we've had a classical formation, and you've, and you've explained yourself to, these, to this lovely audience. 
I still say operas and jazz all comes from ragtime. Ragtime is the mood we're in by beautifying a thing and becoming over-emotional or frustrated so that you want to attract the attention of those who's not paying attention. <laughs> Now, I have a great admiration. I'm awful sorry, Rudy, that Lucky Roberts can't be here. I'm sorry, too. And Lucky was one that, one that we wanted, but we're going to play a kind of a tribute to him later. That's Willie. it. Right. Incidentally, uh, I just finished a lovely recording with Lucky on one side and myself on the other. What's the label? It's, it's for con uh, contemporary music. Oh, wonderful. Incidentally, Nat, ha Nat Hentoff is sitting outside now. Did Nat play it, or did he record it? He supervised the date. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Very lovely. He had Lucky, he had me down first and Lucky down second, so, so, so that uh, emotions wouldn't conflict. You think? <laughs> now, getting back to you, Rudy, and uh, Donald has inspired me, so I should like to further this because I've played a lot of classics and play a lot now. And uh, I always criticize some of the classic writers because some parts of it's hot and where it should really have a real dynamic climax, it dies there. So I should like to play, I should like to play the Polonaise by Chopin. The last 32 bars I rewrote. While you're sitting there, would you try to define for the group here what the word shout means? You were playing shout there, weren't you? Yeah, that was a few strains of shout. In the mic. That was a few strains of shout, ladies and gentlemen. But we had a guy as a shout player. Shout means, uh, that's a religious term. If you go to a Baptist church, you dig those choirs in the afternoon and you'll see that everybody becomes over-emotional. They give vent to their feelings. And I think, I think one of the greatest shouters was James P. Johnson. Right. Right. I, uh, 
I should like to, uh, as we play and Mr. Blesch is talking, I always say that the spiritual forces after a person passes on are still around. So every time I play, I think of Lucky, James P. Johnson, Facts. Naturally, I think of Huey Blake and Donald and Danny Barker. And all these are my close friends. I should like to put that together with the Carolina shout. It shows you how you egg a person on to make him play. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was a Carolina shout written and composed by my good friend and yours, James P. Johnson. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you. What's your third number? Well, I should like to turn my reflexes to another great guy whom I call Filthy. His name was Thomas Fatswaller. When he <coughs> smiled at you, he made you weak. I should like to play Ain't Misbehaving. to talk with folks, I'm all by myself. No 
on the walk with folks, I'm happy that I'm on the shelf. Folks, I ain't misbehaving. I've been saving all my love for you. And I do mean you, yes, you, baby. I don't stay out late, folks, there's usually no place to go. You can find me home about eight, just jiving with that radio. But I ain't misbehaving, folks, I'm saving all my love for you. Like Jack Horner, folks, in the corner, he don't go nowhere, but what do I care? Honey, your kisses, baby, are really worthwhile living for. Please believe me, believe me. I don't stay out late, there's no place to go. You can find me home about eight, just jiving with that radio. But I won't be misbehaving. I'll be saving all my love for you. Yes, 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 yes. You think I says ain't misbehaving. I'm saving all my love. That was the lion. I found out what his secret weapon was in World War I. It's called the holler. <laughs> now, um, Willie gave me a nice idea here. I think we're going to start right at this point and have um, our various players play a tribute to the two great players that he mentioned that have passed on, Fats Waller and James P. And uh, I think that uh, first I wish that Donald Lambert would come up to piano and would play a little medley from Fats Waller. Could you do that? Uh, can you play I've Got a Feeling I'm Fallen? And how about mixing it in with uh, Don't Let It Bother You? <coughs>
And I'm going to ask Donald to make, a, make up a little medley for James P. <coughs> that early blues of James P. Don't, uh, you can't do what my last man did. And then how about ending off with Harlem Fuss? <laughs> UB was one of the great friends of James P. And uh, both UB and James P. were noted for writing tuneful tunes or songs that uh, once you heard them, you never forgot them. And I was thinking of asking UB to play with his own special style at what I think is one of the most beautiful of James P. Johnson's songs, If I Could Be With You One Hour Tonight. Would and follow with old-fashioned love, huh? Old-fashioned love? No, play. Yeah. Old-fashioned love?
you be say that? Like I said, you're not only allowed to know the melody, but you actually hear one, too, and a nice melody. Now, while you're there, Yubi, I thought that we'd have one more little tribute to James P. I'd like for Donald to join you and play the dance tune of James P's that sparked the Charleston craze in the 20s. In other words, the tune called Charleston, right? Join him, Donald. I think if we were to ask Yubi to dance to Charleston, he could do it too, but I'm not going to ask you. I say if we had asked you to dance to Charleston, you could do it too, but I'm not going to ask you. No, I can't. I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> now, we'll have our string trio for a couple of numbers. Uh, let's start off with an early song that dates from the early 1900s, written by Paul Dresser, called uh, My Gal Sal. Paul Dresser was known chiefly as a composer of On the Banks of the Wabash. He also had a brother who was a fairly well-known novelist, came along and made a slight success by the name of Dreiser. But it's all the Dresser family, my gal Sal. <laughs> On the sound, she was a peculiar sort of a gal with a heart that was mellow. She 
was an all round good fellow Talking about my gal Sal With trouble and sorrows and care She was always willing to share But did, 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 did on the level I was out my old gal Sal Ooh, they called her fearful La Sal She was a peculiar son of a gal With a heart that was mellow She was a right good fellow about my gal Sal For troubles and worries and care She was always willing to share She was a wild sort of devil But dead on the level Was my Novel, novel, a tune, very popular, popular America's greatest frantic song, titled Tiger Rag. I'll do an old time trick for you in this tune. Watch me. Move back, fellas. We have to. <laughs> one more concert here and we'll bring back vaudeville. <laughs> Time has come for Willie the Lion to appear on the scene and call his shots. How about it, Willie? So far, how is it, folks? In the mic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. They were speaking of classical things and during the war there was a good friend of mine by the name of Tim Brim who was around at the same time that the great Jean Rees Europe James Rees Europe oh, that's right his brother John played the piano you right? right I should like to play something that I wrote that was a classic with Tim Brim and I will let you decide if not I will tell you the name of it but I think I shall tell you the name it's called Sparklets change the complexion.
think we'll call on Donald next because the rain is threatening. Yes. I think we'll call on Donald next because All the rain right. is threatening. Donald wants to play a number, and he's led me into one of these somatic traps. Come on, Donald. He tells me the title of it is uh, I Know That You Know, but I think it's You Know That I Know, but let's say it's a tune that is either I Know That You Know or You Know That I Know. have to blame the weather for our shortening the program a bit. I had thought that that was a reconnaissance plane that came over an X-2, but I think that they were rainmakers. They were seeding the clouds. So we're going to finish off with one by one by Yubi and then a group number. Yubi wants to play, and I want him to play a famous song from his hit play of 1930, hit musical, The Blackbirds of 1930, a song called Memories of You.
Would you say that these ragtime players swing? Yes. And if they didn't swing, if they didn't swing, it wouldn't mean a thing, would it? But they do. Now, uh, Yubi used to tell me about a man that he called the March King of Baltimore back in the 90s, uh, William Turk, who he said uh, was six foot three, weighed 350 pounds, and as Yubi said, he had a left hand like God. Well, you, uh, William Turk is gone now, isn't he, Yubi? Yes, he is. So if there's any March King of Baltimore left, it's Yubi Blake. And I think we ought to go out pay our respects to the rain with a rather well-known little march. I think it was run off by John Philip Sousa called Stars and Stripes Forever in the old Baltimore march style. From the history of American music on one keyboard. Judy Blake, Willie the Lion, Donald Lambert, and the string trio, Danny Barker, and Al.